are talking about Manchester United, obviously in action in the Champions League today. They have to beat Bayern. They have to hope that Galatasaray and Copenhagen draw their game if they are to progress to the next round. So obviously there's a lot of pressure, a lot of talk about them at the moment. And I want to start with you here, Mark, because if they do not get through in the Champions League, what are the chances that Eric Ten Hag will be fired? I don't think it'll be um, on the back of losing the Champions League game or getting knocked out of the Champions League. I, I think the situation at United right now is that everything is in limbo until the ownership situation or the less the ownership, more a case of the, the management above Ten Hag changes because we know that Sir Jim Radcliffe and his team are going to come in at some point very soon. I think that is when the clock starts ticking on, on Ten Hag because as it stands right now, there's nobody there to dismiss him because the Glazers aren't going to do it right now because they've got more interest in the situation of changing the emphasis of the, the structure beneath them. So it will all depend on Sir Jim Radcliffe coming in. And, and I would guess that with this season pretty much a write-off, I think United are going to struggle to get into the Champions League spaces. It might be a case of let's get to the summer and then make a, a cold-hearted judgment on Ten Hag by then and even maybe give Ten Hag the opportunity to lose his job in the sense that if he doesn't get into the Champions League, then it's easy for the new regime to say, right, you've failed to get into the Champions League, you've, you've taken the team backwards, it's time to move on. Mid-season, with no options, no obvious options to come in and replace him, I think it's going to be difficult for Ten Hag to go, unless results get really, really bad. I think Ten Hag stays into the summer for a variety of reasons, not because he's doing a good job, because of the situation whereby there's a bit of a, a void up above him and there's no real obvious candidates going to replace him until the end of the season. Where do you stand on that, Yanish? Well, to me, it's a bigger problem. I mean, it's almost like crossing the Rubicon. That's that's where they are in those next two games, right? More of an existential question about Manchester United in general. But I, I'm with Mark uh, because there's always that hope uh, that when Sir uh, Jim Ratcliffe comes in, maybe there's going to be some deeper changes that are going to go over the years. Because uh, let's be honest here. I mean, we're, we're looking at Manchester United, you know, that we're talking about how massive of a club that is. But this rebuild, it seems to be taken now for what? To 12, 13 years since Sir Alex Ferguson has left. You look at Arsenal, who had a similar situation with uh, Arsene Wenger, and they're coming back uh, in a short period of time. We'll probably get to Chelsea, but I feel that Chelsea are going to get there uh, uh, before that. Maybe who knows? Uh, so my issues here that you know I'm looking at Manchester United team that at the moment is uh, uh, it feels like a, a retirement club rather than anything else. So I, I, he'll stick around, but I think uh, you know today uh, you know what happens when Harry Kane uh, comes in and scores a couple, which I believe he may, uh, and then you lose to Liverpool. Uh, uh, but but I'll just I'll go with Mark because he's probably right. Who's going to pull the trigger? Oh, Janusz, where's that spirit of Eintracht Frankfurt that maybe Manchester United could have against Bayern Munich? Well, yeah, you know, you know, I knew you were going to go about, you know, um, Bayern Munich maybe are at their best, but I look at that squad, right? Look at the team of Bayern Munich. Look at the player in every position, and look at Manchester United. I, I don't think it's even close. So, I mean, they're maybe in a bad way, Bayern Munich, but if you're going to get them going, you'd feel that, okay, with the sort of players that Bayern Munich have, it's much much easier, much closer to get the ship right than it is with Manchester United. Because no matter where you look, I, I, you don't see one world-class player. You really don't. And, you know, Bruno, I don't want to start this going here, but, okay, he seems like one, but he doesn't act like one. Ryan, you've actually written about the terrible times at Manchester United as your latest article. What are the main points that you've picked out there? Yeah, I just tried to um, sort of list the reasons for why the team is so terrible, basically, because I think um, I think with Manchester United, right, like on the one hand, uh, there are underperforming players, there are injuries, there are questions over Ten Hag um all of the decisions he's making this year there's questions over who they're signing and on the other hand like this is just the same pattern that's been persisting for 10 years right where it's um since Sir Alex Ferguson left they'll finish second or third then they'll finish sixth or seventh and then they'll bring in a new coach and then all of a sudden they'll finish third or fourth and it'll feel like a success even though like third or fourth place isn't successful for Manchester United. Like it shouldn't be given how much money the team has, but because the team has underperformed so badly and they have this volatile kind of up and down, um, you know, uh, performance level from season to season, you know, it, you kind of convince yourself that, Oh, they, they finished in third. Like this is progress for 
a team that has more money than all but two teams on planet earth. So yeah, I just try to, I tried to list out the reasons. And I think, you know, it all comes back to ownership ultimately, as we're, we're talking about, because ownership, the Glazers are the only people that have been at Manchester United since Sir Alex Ferguson left. Everyone else has cycled in and out. Um, and all the same stuff continues happening. But at the same time, I think that there's specific reasons for why the team currently is, they have the worst goal differential they've had since Sir Alex Ferguson left through 16 games. So there's a pretty good argument that this is actually the worst that they've been at any point. Yeah, there was that stat that from 92-93 to the 12-13 season under Sir Alex, United only suffered nine shutout losses at home by at least three goals. Well, since the 13-14 season, it's now happened 15 times. But Mark, to go to the dressing room, Scott McTominay has actually said that the dressing room is no longer toxic, which is different to how it was under some of the recently previous managers at Manchester United. And he insists that Ten Hag has changed the culture at the club. I don't believe any of that, though. That, that, that I'll tell you why I don't believe it. It's because when the dressing room was supposedly toxic, they weren't saying it was toxic. It was the, the message we were getting out of the dressing room at the time. Was, oh, no, it's a great spirit within the camp and everyone gets on. It's only afterwards that people admit that actually it wasn't quite like that. And when results are so bad, you know, if the dressing room isn't toxic at the moment, that'd be quite a worry because you'd, you'd hope that there'd be people in that dressing room arguing with each other and pulling each other up and, and telling each other they're not doing the job. And if it's not like that, then that is a problem. So I think when players come out and say, the dressing room's great and the spirit's great and it's not toxic anymore. I think that right, that right to tell us it actually is because it, it, it doesn't stand up that the fact results are so bad that it shouldn't be a happy camp. I mean, Yannis will know better than me, but when a team's not winning, if it's a happy camp, there's something not quite right. So mm. I, I don't buy into that, what McTominay's saying. I, I think the reality is that the Man United dressing room and the squad is quite split. And I think you're seeing that with performances every week. Go on, Yannis. Yeah, no, and and you know the, the issue here is really, I mean, we toxic or not. I mean, you look at Manchester United, and we often talk about mentality, right? And it's too often. What is mentality, right? Look at this team. Any sign of trouble, and this this team folds the tent. I mean, it's unacceptable against Bournemouth. So, I mean, we can sit here and talk about Antonio Irola, who you know just a week or two ago we were saying that Gary Neal shouldn't have been let go, and he had a tough start. And you look at this situation, just smart and all that. Any team can pretty much now be. Manchester United home or away that's the bottom line and the problem is with the recruitment I mean you have a recruitment I mean who wants to come to Manchester United let's be honest we used to say that but we were maybe afraid because of I don't know uh, uh, you know people online I, I, I don't really care I mean you look at this Manchester United the only players that are coming there is that the Ten Hag knows nobody else is coming who's going to really come to this team right now I mean any any player of note is going to come to this mess, not because of Ten Hag, not because of the dressing room, but because of the whole situation. And really, Manchester United, and Ryan has said it, you know, the biggest club is second or third bet, but it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I would not come in there because there's no chance for success. I mean, you know, this is a retirement club, right? I mean, if you look at Ericsson, look at Casemiro, look at Varane, even though I have respect them and to some degree I would like to see Varane again, but with the injuries, with the age, with where they are in their career, how can this be successful? I mean, where are the young players that we used to see? Or, or where's the idea of building a club that, okay, we are where we are. This is not one year, not two years, not three years. This has been, for the most part, what, 10, 12 years of this. And <laughs> there's no light at the end of the tunnel. So I think at the end of it, it really comes down to the players that you have and how much can you get out of them, right? You know, Martial, I don't want to go there. Hoylund, nice guy. I'm sure he'll go, he'll come good, maybe finally score a goal or two, right? But you know, you could have maybe you could have had Harry Kane, although I don't believe he wanted to uh to come there. And then you know, McTominay thinks he's Ronaldo right now. Fair play. I mean, uh, but but you know there's some wrong when your best player is McTominay. You know the situation is not great, and by no means am I taking anything away from him. Well, you mentioned Ronaldo, so let me just put this to you, Ryan. Before we finish on Manchester United, we're getting some comments through right now saying Cristiano Ronaldo is right after all. What do you think of such comments? <laughs> oh God. Uh... I mean, he was right in terms of his criticisms of the unprofessionalness and just mm -hmm. kind of the mess that the club is. But at the same time, I actually credit Ten Hag for cutting ties with Ronaldo. I don't think that was an easy decision. Um, and Manchester United did get uh, immediately much better as soon as <laughs> Ronaldo stopped playing. So I think they were right to get rid of him. But I also think that Ronaldo's criticisms of 
you know, the just how kind of stuck in the past and unmodernized this team is, we're also correct. Go on, Mark. Yeah, I, I just want to say, Ronaldo, I think that, you know, as well as he did in that first season, all the goals he scored, I think that the root of United's problems at, right now, and they've had a lot of problems, but I think the root of them right now is bringing Ronaldo back. What was it, two years ago? And only going to Solskjaer because at that point, Solskjaer looked like he just might have been getting something going. He had Rashford playing really well, and he had other players that were just kind of coming to the fore. And Ronaldo came in and just completely exploded the, the kind of harmony in the squad. And he was the big ego, and people had their kind of nose put out of joint. People didn't like it. And that sense of selfishness that a few players have developed since then, that maybe Ronaldo kind of had more than anybody else, remains. You know, there's a lot of players that are playing for themselves or not playing for the teammates. I think that stems from the kind of the earthquake we had when Ronaldo came back, and it was almost like every player for himself. And that mentality has stayed, and, and Ten Hag hasn't been able to eradicate that. He's, he hasn't got the personality or the, I think the, the credibility amongst the squad to, to get rid of that. So what United need right now is a kind of complete reset. It's like Man City had at the outset of their kind of growth and the shape. Man saw the kind of a project that comes along and it, it, it encourages players to come along in the sense that something's changing, something different, something exciting. There's nothing exciting about Man United right now. So until it changes, it will remain the same. This, this kind of miserable club that everyone wants to get away from it won't change until they have this kind of exciting project to appeal to people. Meanwhile, there's some tough times up on Chelsea right now and a lot of talk about Mauricio Pochettino's future, especially on our ESPN FC show. Where do you stand on it, Yanis? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, speaking of recruitment, right, we were just talking about Manchester, uh, uh, Manchester United and you look at Chelsea, uh, where do I stand? I mean, uh, it's a process. I, I actually, you know, you think I'm going to... I'm crazy, but I think it's going to come good. At least there's an idea. And although it's not going to come good this year, I think it was calculated risk. And 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 maybe the only reason uh, that I'm I'm skeptical a little bit is is that they didn't take care of the biggest problem, which is uh, obviously scoring for them. Uh, but but I think if I look at the players that are out, I do believe that Christopher Nkunku, when he comes back, uh, he's going to help the team. I think that you know the likes of Ben Chilwell, uh, uh, Wesley Fofana, those are big losses. When you look at the, as young as the team. Was, was. You look at it, some of the key players that haven't come good just yet. So pressure on Pochettino because I do think that he should have maybe have a little bit of uh, of an identity. But I think this was built in to some degree with everything that has happened to Chelsea over the years. Uh, do I think they should have been higher in the table? Absolutely. But if we're talking about managing crisis, and and I think we are with Manchester United and Chelsea, uh, I think. Uh, I have better hope for Chelsea uh, at this stage. So it's not great, uh, but I think it'll come good. Oh, that, that's actually a little segue into the next question I have. It's something that we brought up on FC, and I'll put it to both of you, Ryan and Mark. I'll start with you, Ryan. As to which team is worse with Chelsea or Manchester United, we actually put it to our ex-players, which team they would rather be on right now. And the feeling among them was Chelsea, and Stevie Nicol was explaining that even just driving into the car park to be at a team like Manchester United at the moment would feel very heavy for him, knowing everything that's going on there at the club. But which team do you think is worse, Chelsea or Manchester United? In some sense, it feels uh, crazy to say that Chelsea's uh, better than Manchester United, given uh, the game they just played recently, which in some ways was probably one of Man probably Manchester United's best game of the season. They should have won by way more, I think. But on the whole, I, I'd much rather be Chelsea. One, you just look at the talent on the team. They, you know, one of the benefits of building the team and the way they're doing, they have a lot of good players, even if it's hard to figure out who the actual good players are and who should be playing. And then two, I think, like with Chelsea's struggles, a lot of the games, not recently, the, their form has dipped recently and they've been quite poor. But a lot of their losses earlier in the season were games where they created a ton of chances and you know, Nicholas Jackson basically didn't score while Manchester United, Manchester United aren't losing games where it's like, Oh, they cr created 10 great chances. They just couldn't finish. It's no, they didn't create anything. And the other team created a ton. So I think kind of the underlying health of the teams, both from like the um, health of the squad itself and then the health of the performances, despite the way it looked when they played each other, I would, I would lean Chelsea. What'd you say, Mark? Yeah, listen, I, I think, Chelsea have got a brighter future in the sense that, you know, they have they have made a lot of mistakes with recruitment. They, they've signed too many young players, but at least they're not cutting corners by trying to sign players. They're not trying to do it on the cheap. Now, Man United are doing it on the cheap. Rasmus Hoyland was a cheap version of Harry Kane, and you get what you pay for. Chelsea are not signing players like Sophie and Amrabat that are, you know, 
loan signings that are just there to do a patch up job. So Man United are signing patch up players and players that they, they think will do a job but not sure of. I think Chelsea at least are showing some ambition. And when it all settles down at Chelsea, they have got some very good players there that will find their feet eventually if they can drop in a couple of experienced players. At United right now, they're just in this kind of this terminal decline. And, you know, I think somebody made the point recently, next player, that everything about United looks really down. You know, even the manager doesn't smile. And he's the guy that's meant to lead and trying to motivate people. And he looks the most miserable man on the planet right now. He never smiles. So if that's your boss and you're a player and you're looking to him for guidance, you're thinking, mate, come on, just, you know, lighten up a little bit and bring some, bring some, bring some levity to this. And it's, it's really, really downbeat at United right now. So I think Chelsea haven't got those problems. Chelsea's problems are different. And I think long term, I think, or even medium term, I think Chelsea are a better bet. Let me go around the table. I'll start with you then, Mark. We've got Chelsea will finish mm, this season in the Premier League. So they're 12th now. I think it's 14 points off the top four. What position mm. do you think they finish in? I mean, they're eight points behind United. So let's. I've, I think that United will just finish above Chelsea, in the, but I think United maybe finish sixth and Chelsea finish seventh, but I think Chelsea will close the gap. But it's, it's a very big gap to the top four. I don't see them closing that gap at all. Yanish? Yeah, nowhere near to top four, but I think they will be close to uh, Manchester United. The eight points is not insignificant with all the issues that United have. It's still eight points. But I think when Chelsea starts recovering players, you're going to see an uptick because uh, that's a big thing. We you know, we often say what's well, an excuse. I think in, when I look at Chelsea, that's a bigger problem for them than for many other teams uh, uh, in the table. Ryan? I think they're going to finish like eighth or ninth. Um, I, that doesn't mean they're, I think they'll win more than the eighth or ninth most points for the rest of the year. They just have built such a big hole. And then, you know, Brighton, Aston Villa, Newcastle, Tottenham, you have all those teams ahead of them that are going to be hard to catch as well. So I could see them catching United, but I, I, I don't know if I see them going much higher than eighth or ninth. So let's get to some of the chasing pack in the title race. Obviously, City defending champions. But right now, the table is not looking how many may have expected it to look at this stage of the season, at the beginning of the season. So we want to talk on a more positive note here, Yanish, about Arsenal and Liverpool. We've actually stressed here that these are the two biggest challenges to Manchester City this season. But who's the front runner of the two of them, given the way City have been playing this season as well? And is City still the front runner for you in the title race this weekend? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not changing that. Uh, I think if you look at Manchester City, obviously they're going through some uh, issues right now. And uh, one, the biggest one, I think Pep Guardiola won't worry too much about uh, going forward is defensively. As we've said before, and, and City ha has won uh, so many trophies just as much uh because, because of the defensive game as the attacking game. They've been superb, and that's something that's missing, and they've been conceding goals left and right. I don't think even Pep Guardiola right now knows who the best back four or three, however he decides to play. Uh, uh, so once he gets that uh, uh, figured out, and I think he will, Manchester City will continue, in my view, be to be uh, uh, the overwhelming still, in my opinion, um, uh, winners. Uh, uh, if I had to pick between Liverpool and, and Arsenal, you know, that's not an easy choice for me. Uh, I think Liverpool are surprisingly up there. I think uh, Jurgen Klopp would be the first one to admit to that. I worry a little bit about Mo Salah leaving for African Cup of Nations uh, as well and uh, how that's going to work. The midfield still work in progress and then some defensively not absolutely sound. So at this moment, I think Arsenal is, are a little bit better off if I look at the whole squad and the consistency than Liverpool. Max, do you just laugh when he said surprising Liverpool are up there? No, no, I was laughing when he said... I was, it was a kind of a, a laugh of acknowledgement when he said that City are the favourites because despite their problems, it is the reality that, you know, City are that good that you can't write them off. And I think I think that both Arsenal and Liverpool need a maybe a nine or ten point lead by the 1st of January to have a real chance of winning the league. And that that's a tribute to Man City's ability to, to, to come back from nowhere to win the league. And I think, you know, a nine or ten point lead in a competitive Premier League like this season, it might just be enough because I think City have got more points, but I don't think they'll drop many. So a nine or ten point lead, I think it'll be just about the right cushion for either of those teams to hold them off. But one thing, I, I, I think the only thing we can guarantee is that the second half of the season, City will find a surge and the likes of Arsenal Liverpool might find it going a bit tough because, like Yana says, Salah, African Nations, Arsenal, the doubts of last year's running might creep in again. So that's when City are most dangerous, you know, that in that last two or three months of the season. So nine or ten points by January the 1st, that's, that's the task for Liverpool and Arsenal. Yeah, that's got to be in their minds, hasn't it? City's second half season push. Arsenal or Liverpool for you, Ryan? 
I think to me, they're like, they're interesting because with, it's sort of a question of like, do you want the team with like the arguably the best attack in the league or the team with arguably the best defense, um, Liverpool, the attack, <laughs> Arsenal, the defense. And to that question, I honestly, given how hard it is to take down Manchester city, I feel like when you have the attack that Liverpool has, they have a higher ceiling than Arsenal do. While Arsenal probably have a higher floor. And, you know, if you want to win the Premier League, I think you want the higher ceiling. Plus, Liverpool do have a current uh, lead on Arsenal on the table, which makes a difference. So I, I would lean Liverpool. I I agree with the guys, though, that we do this every year. Uh, Manchester City are still the favorites, but it's different this year because they have two team, teams chasing them instead of one. So I think that that makes it more likely that one of them kind of, you know, hits a hot patch and, and ends up nipping them at the end. And obviously, for as long as Pep Guardiola is in charge at Manchester City, it'll probably continue that they will be the favourite. But let's talk about his future, if we can, Mark. It's something that does come up now and again, and we really want to get there because mm. his new deal takes him to the 24-25 season. Where do you think he'll be right before the 2026 World Cup? Because we are seeing rumours about him maybe being a national team coach, maybe even England in the future. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's two questions there. Where do we see him? I think the England job, I think we can rule that out straight away because... He'll, he'll cost too much money for the FA. And the, the FA, have, the English FA have come down a different path. What they want to do is kind of give a nod to their St. George's Park production line of coaches. So when Gareth Southgate goes, it will be another kind of Gareth Southgate. It'll be, they will do everything they can to find an English coach or a coach who's come through the English system. So, And it will cost about a, a fraction of what Pep Guardiola would want pay for. So I don't think Pep Guardiola is going to be anywhere near the England job anytime soon. At Man City, I... Look, I mean, when he came in 2016, the idea was it was a three-year project and he's still there because Man City know, their owners know that there is no other option. It's Pep Guardiola and that is it. If Pep Guardiola was to leave tomorrow, where would they go? There is no obvious option. They've seen what happened at Man United when Sorex Ferguson left, so City will do everything they possibly can to keep Pep. No matter what happens this season, they will do everything they can. And they've done that twice now. Each time his contract's been close to going up, they said, look, Pep, you can do whatever you want. You can have whatever you want. We'll pay whatever you want. Get whoever you want to play for you. And he stays. So I think Pep will still beat Man City in 2026. I don't think he'll go. What do you think, Anish? Absolutely. There's absolutely zero reason and no team that he should go to, really. Unless, I mean, I don't know. The only one I could think of was PSG. But that that project is absolutely crazy and unstable. And I think he likes the stability. He likes the fact that he's going to get the players that he wants. The whole club is behind him. So I don't see him for the foreseeable, foreseeable future going anywhere. And after that, uh, he's already won everything there is to be won in this game. Uh, uh, the only other thing I can see is uh, Major League Soccer. I really can. We all know how much he loves New York, NYC. CFC, new stadium being built. And I'm talking about three, four, five years. And maybe that's going to be his way to, you know, combining the love of uh, uh, New York City, United States, and 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 maybe uh, maybe the team. And in the end, maybe Spain, right? That would make sense. Uh, there's always a lot of young players that he'll probably enjoy playing. But uh, uh, that's, you know, that's me just guessing. It's probably crazy. But uh, I don't see him leaving. It's, it's sort of the same with Klopp, right? Where Klopp said, eh, I'll probably be gone. He's still at Liverpool because he sees that they're both in the best league in the world right now. And and uh, why go elsewhere? Well, you mentioned MLS. Let's just put a crazy one out there. This is just us creating this, Ryan. You definitely wouldn't say no to him for the US men's national team, would you? Well, there you go. No, I'd take Berhalter over him. <laughs> <laughs> Right, that is getting you kicked out of the show. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us.